Buenos dias a todos y feliz año nuevo. My name is Carlos Benchaca, and I am the chair of the Committee on Immigration here in the New York City Council and represent District 38 in Sunset Park and Red Hook, Brooklyn. It's a special hearing because the first city council hearing of 2020 is being held by the Immigration Committee. I want to thank Councilmember Danny Drum from Queens for being here today and all the members of our committee. As we enter the new year, it's important to center ourselves and recommit to the values that lead our work here in this committee and to outline some goals that I have for the rest of the session. New York City is an immigrant city. Somos una ciudad de inmigrantes, and we've always known that. And as we discuss the issues, we must acknowledge our immigrant neighbors as central and integral pillars of our city and the needed focus to shape policies to ensure their success as it is linked to the success of the city. Today, New York City is home to 3.2 million immigrants, the largest number of immigrants in our city. That means that nearly 37% of our neighbors are immigrants and 44% of our coworkers are foreign born. Our mantra is simple. The immigrant experience is the American experience, the New Yorker experience. And our collective work on behalf of our communities lead us to educate our children, care for our sick, keep our streets clean, or protect our neighbors from bad landlords. In all of these spaces, we necessarily ta are talking about immigrants in New York. When we think about how best to help small businesses or make our streets safe for everyone, we are necessarily talking about immigrant New Yorkers. Through this lens, housing is an immigration issue. Healthcare is an immigration issue. Education is an immigration issue. And in this committee, as we oversee the city's effort to make life better, safer, and more affordable for all, we will ask questions about how all policies affect immigrant New Yorkers. Not because they are a special class to consider, but because they are, we are, New Yorkers. Those ideas must also come directly from communities impacted by our sometimes broken policies at the federal level, at the state level, even here at the city level. And they come as ideas from our people. Our tradition is to start with a public panel to set the tone. And in that space come both ideas and feelings of fear and hope. Our immigrant neighbors speak about the shadows that they find themselves in and the feelings of being invisible. Basta, step out of those shadows and be seen. For you are the light that burns bright in the torch held so proudly by Lady Liberty as she welcomes and continues to welcome the masses for generations to come. So step out and be seen, for you are the light of the city. Today the committee will be hearing a package of four bills that intend to enshrine this kind of commitment. These bills build on the work begun in 2017 with the passage of Local Laws 185 and 186 of 2017 and continue through the committee's oversight of MOYA, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, and their implementation of these laws and their portfolio of programmatic initiatives. I want to leave some time for colleagues to make statements on those bills that they've sponsored, so I will restrict my comments to just the basics of these bills for them to be able to speak about their work and our work here in our committee. So the first bill before the committee is introduction 1636, sponsored by Councilmember Drum in relation to establishing the Department of Immigrant Affairs. And with that, I defer to Councilmember Drum to speak on his bill. Thank you. Since my days chairing the Committee on Immigration, I have worked to ensure our city does all it can to be a safe and welcoming home for our immigrant families, friends, and neighbors. I know the current chair, Carlos Menchaca, 
certainly believes the same and am grateful to him for hearing intro 1636 today. 10 years ago, the landscape was very different. The Bloomberg administration made bold sounding but generic statements to a national audience about immigration reform, but largely ignored the pleas of myself and immigrant advocates to enact actual policies that would positively impact immigrant lives here in New York City. At that time, the criminal justice system collaborated with ICE to send immigrants into deportation detention complex. Before she became speaker, Melissa Mark Viverito and I were initially met with derision when we fought to evict the ICE agents from our jails. Very recent expressions of contrition aside, our mayor plowed ahead with a stop and frisk policy that destroyed many black and brown lives, including countless immigrants in my district who were deported as a result. On the flip side, there was virtually no help for immigrant crime victims seeking law enforcement assistance with U and T visa certifications. Despite executive, off, uh, executive orders, city agencies struggled with language access and did not seem to know or care about the demographics of the communities they were supposed to be serving. Legal funding earmarked for immigration attorneys was non-existent. Adult literacy funding was woefully inadequate and something the council always needed to cover. And the list goes on. In other words, the more, the, the more than one in three New Yorkers who were born in other countries simply were not a priority. How things have changed in the past decade. Now ICE is largely out of our criminal justice system. Now immigrant crime victims can turn to the police and other agencies for help with U and T visas. Now with IDNYC, no New Yorker has to fear that simple interaction with the police will lead to deportation or that they will be barred from their child's school or other buildings they need to access. Now, our city boasts the most robust program for immigrant legal services in the country. Now, our city is keeping track of the diverse communities it serves and will be using that data to improve. I am grateful to Mayor de Blasio and Commissioner Bita Mustafi for their work. We all seem to agree that we need to be responsive to our immigrant communities. Intro 1636, which would create a Department of Immigrant Affairs, is the culmination of years of prog progress and the recognition that we need not just to preserve that progress, but to build upon it, regardless of who the mayor is. This bill does this by building upon Local Laws 185 and 186 of 2017, which included my legislation to strengthen the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Cities across the country now stand as bulwarks against a xenophobic and unconstitutional White House, and making the Office of Immig Immigrant Affairs into a department is a crucial part of protecting immigrants and helping them flourish. I thank you, and I look forward to hearing from the administration and the advocates. Thank you, Councilmember Drummond. Always a honor and privilege to be working with you uh, not just as a chair, but as a colleague and a New Yorker Thank on all these issues. And the history that we just heard is part of what I think is going to keep driving us to keep moving forward. And we're not done. We have another introduction, number 1836, sponsored by Councilmember Moya in relation to replacing the term alien with non-citizen and addressing other matters found to be obsolete. I will give opportunity for Councilmember Moya to speak on his bill later today. The other two bills before the committee, sponsored by myself, seek to codify the values I discussed by ensuring that the city's policy always consider their impact on immigrant New Yorkers. And they are also the product of the committee's ongoing oversight. Introduction number 1835 would expand the interagency task force on immigrant affairs by creating a speaker appointed co-chair to the task force and placing a minimum quarterly meeting requirement. We have another pre-considered introduction that would expand the annual reporting requirements of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. And both of these bills are examples of how we need to perfect our approach to policy making with respect to immigrant New Yorkers. In 2017, I sponsored a bill to create an interagency task force led by the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. The idea was simple. If every agency's work touches the lives of immigrants in some way, 
then there should be a deliberate coordination between city agencies to ensure every New Yorker's assistance. Over the course of the session, the committee has made multiple requests for information about the task force with great difficulty. Introduction 1837, sorry, 1835 would expand the existing task force to ensure this information is easily available and transparent to all. The same principle was behind mandating an annual report from the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. And as a city and entity most dedicated to thinking about how our policies affect immigrant New Yorkers, we the people should know what programs the office is implementing and how it is addressing challenges identified. This information benefits more than the aims of the Council's oversight. It is critical information for the many organizations serving immigrants across the city. In June of 2019, the committee held an oversight hearing on Moya's annual report to examine the data that informs the programs and policy decisions made by Moya. Through this oversight, we discovered gaps in the reporting and opportunities to make the presentation of data and the metrics used to evaluate success more transparent. This pre-considered legislation is the result. So I look forward to the fruitful conversation we'll be having today with the administration. And as we look to this next year, I hope that we can continue to work together to strengthen our communities for all New Yorkers, by making New York City a more welcoming city for all people, regardless of their national origin, language, or creed. I wanna thank the incredible work our committee staff have been doing to prepare for this hearing, and that include our committee counsel, Harbani Auja, committee counsel policy analyst, Elizabeth Kronk, committee data analyst, Ben Witt, and my staff, chief of staff, Lorena Lucero, and Legislative Director uh, Cesar Vargas and my Communications Director Tony Chirito. I also want to welcome our Brooklyn Council Member Matthew Eugene. We are going to call up the first panel and we are calling up the Commissioner Bita Mustofi and as she walks up I want to say thank you to her and her team. Uh, we've been doing a lot of good work and we continue to do this work in the name of our immigrant communities and I can't wait to continue to this not just this discussion but the many discussions that are ahead of us as we confront so much. I also want to acknowledge and been watching you on, on Twitter and just kind of following the incredible work that you're, you're doing out of just that personal moment and connection to Iran and your, your heritage. And so I just want to know that, I want you to know that we're with you and the community here and we're, we're in this together. Thank you. Thank you for, for that. Thank you so much. And we're going to swear you in before you begin officially. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Chairman Chaka um, and members of the committee and council member Drum. My name is Bita Mustofi. I'm the commissioner for the mayor's office of immigrant affairs. My testimony today will provide some context about the work that Moya engages in day to day to ensure the well-being of immigrant New Yorkers, and I will then turn to the four bills on the agenda for today. Um, I want to thank the chair and the committee members for their partnership in serving immigrant New Yorkers, especially over the last few years. This partnership, as well as our partnership with city agencies and with community-based organizations, has been crucial in the fight to address the needs of all New Yorkers, regardless of status. We look forward to continuing to work with you in 2020. Before addressing the bills, as I stated, I wanted to speak briefly to the work of the office. Moya's role and approach to interagency collaborations has been integral to the city's successes in the area of serving immigrants, even at a time when the federal government is launching attack after attack on immigrant communities. Situated within the mayor's office, Moya has been able to work with our partner agencies to respond quickly and effectively to a host of federal changes, including through multi-agency response. As one example, during the family separation crises, Moya coordinated with myriad agency partners to quickly deliver important services to separated children and their families. This has been a theme of our work over the past few years. We've used our bully pulpit and existing infrastructure to efficiently meet the needs of the moment, coordinating the response across multiple agencies to swiftly respond to sudden federal policy changes. 
This includes convening partners around public charge, the travel ban, threatened raids, and attacks on DACA and TPS, amongst others. Similarly, we have been able to use our role as a mayoral office to help organize a national coalition of like-minded mayors in cities and counties in our advocacy and education on behalf of immigrant New Yorkers at the federal level. Through this advocacy, we've coordinated mayoral sign-on letters and comments, including a condemnation of the Trump administration's efforts to make it harder to naturalize. We collaborated in the development of multi-city amici briefs, including for the DACA case currently before the Supreme Court. Turning to our work internally and in conjunction with our partner agencies, Moya is best suited to coordinate among and influence the various city agencies, offices, and other entities that regularly interact with immigrants from within the mayor's office. In conjunction with the Mayor's Office of Operations, Moya monitors and reports on the progress of agencies covered by the city's language access law, Local Law 30, something that requires engagement across 35 agencies. We additionally provide language services support for over 15 mayoral offices. Similarly, Moya is the office tasked with supporting and reporting on the actions of all city agencies in relation to immigration enforcement requests pursuant to Local Law 228. Moya is best suited to coordinate among and influence the various agencies, offices, and others that regularly interact with immigrants from within the mayor's office with the support of City Hall. The Interagency Immigrant Task Force has served an important role in cultivating the expertise and best practices of our agencies in serving New Yorkers, providing notice of key federal policy updates and changes, and identifying key ways to build on work to better serve immigrant communities. 11 members of the task force are mandated to be present, but we didn't think that was enough, so we invited nine additional agencies. The task force has served as a way for Moya and agencies to share programmatic updates, like the launch of NYC CARE and IDNYC renewals, and CCHR's recent published enforcement guidance about discrimination based on immigration status and national origin. At task force meetings, agencies learn from each other's practices. During a task force meeting last year, agencies discussed what they were doing in response to impending raids. At another task force meeting, the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection shared best practices around engaging in immigrant communities. The task force is one of several ways that we work with agencies to ensure that the city is serving the needs of immigrant communities. The task force, however, is not the only way, nor should it be, that Moya engages agencies. Because the agencies involved in the task force range from smaller offices to larger social, social service departments, a one-size approach to immigrant inclusion in every situation would be inappropriate and ineffective. Instead, we work with agencies outside of the task force to improve access to services and address immigrant needs in ways most conducive to advancing those goals. For example, through language access work, we convene agency language access coordinators on Local Law 30, develop and distribute guidance materials to agencies, and meet with agencies one-on-one -on -one with, agenc with agencies to discuss implementation and offer technical assistance. Much of this work requires working closely with the individual agency and adapting to the best way of accomplishing the shared goals with them. As another example in our partnership with New York City Emergency Management, which is one of the agencies we've invited to join the task force, it is more efficient for us to engage with them one-on-one -on -one in situations when we assist with providing language access support instead of using the task force meeting for that purpose. Moya's approach to interagency work recognizes the subject matter expertise of our partners and builds on that expertise to expand access to immigrant New Yorkers. One example of that approach and its effectiveness can be seen in the work we're doing with NYC CARE. Instead of Moya creating and running a healthcare program for immigrants, we're working with New York City Health and Hospitals, which has both the infrastructure and expertise to implement such a program, while providing specific areas of support on understanding the essential issues in serving health needs of immigrant communities and coordinating outreach for that program to ensure we're effectively reaching immigrant communities. We have taken a similar track when working with DCWP, or the Department for Consumer and Worker Protection. DCWP has the expertise in workers' issues, so Moya partnered with them to develop multilingual immigrant worker rights information, sharing our expertise of the unique challenges faced by immigrants. 
And as such, we've discussed previously, and, th and as this committee knows, the city's public charge work is fundamentally a collaborative effort across many agencies. Nearly 40% of our city's population is foreign born. The inclusion of their families takes you to 60%. The work of our entire city must and should consider their unique needs and situations, instead of being siloed in one department. This work should be centered in a mayoral office that can work across city government, leverage city resources, and identify opportunities for partnership. IDNYC, for example, US uses DSSHRA human services, resources support, IT support, legal department, and space, which allowed the city to build out a program the size of IDNYC. Additionally, programs that are meant to be cross-cutting and serve myriad populations are operationally best situated within other agencies. This helps remove any stigma around seeking services while ensuring that an immigrant-focused lens can be applied through partnership with our office. As one example, we're working to incorporate Action NYC into the existing civil legal services infrastructure that lives in DSS HRA's Office of Civil Justice, while maintaining our role in helping to set the administration's policy and programmatic goals for better serving immigrant New Yorkers. This will consolidate all legal services into DSS HRA and as a result, increase transparency and efficiency. I will now turn to the four bills on the agenda today. Moya strongly supports the proposal to remove the offensive and dehumanizing term alien from city administrative code wherever possible. Moya has been working on a similar proposal alongside the City Commission on Human Rights and the Law Department, and we're thrilled to see this introduced by the Council. In terms of intro 1836, we have some technical edits that we can share, as well as additional provisions where we believe language ought to be changed in the human rights law. In our work with CCHR and the Law Department, we've identified some state law issues. We are nevertheless certain that we share the same goal here and look forward to continuing discussions about this bill with the Council. Maya is also grateful to be able to work with the Council and the Chair in particular on continuing to build on the just two-year-old annual report. As I testified last summer, the annual report has been used by both advocates and by other community members who were eager to see the data we provided about immigrant New Yorkers and our programs. We're particularly proud of the role Moya plays in partnership with New York City Office for Economic Opportunity and national researchers, such as the Center for Migration Studies, in using American community survey data to estimate the city's various immigrant groups, including the undocumented population. This data has been a crucial source for stakeholders in the city, including the media, in understanding our communities. We're happy to continue the discussions started last summer about the information in Moya should include in the report. And as you are no doubt aware, we're currently drafting the annual report for 2019 and incorporating some of the feedback that we received from the council in the summer. Many of the provisions outlined in the bill coincide with that feedback, and we're interested in working with the council to assess what additional metrics and data we can report on, and we look forward to those discussions. Moya appreciates council's interest in, in the interagency immigrant task force as well. However, the city has concerns about the proposal outlined in intro 1835. The task force as created by the council in, in 2017 is a city task force led by Moya an office of the mayor, and as mentioned earlier, has been working effectively. We're concerned how a co-chaired task force would operate and how that would impact the, the task force's important work. We would like to work with the council to find ways to keep council better informed and better involved in the work of the task force while maintaining its effective structure and role within the administration. Moy looks forward to further discussions on, uh, with the council on the intent and proposals for intro 1835. And finally, in regard to Intro 1636, we deeply appreciate the goals of this bill to ensure not just the recognition of the importance of the work of Moya for our city, but also the ability for it to be showcased properly. This is why we were happy to work with the council on the changes to Moya's mandate made in 2017. However, we do have serious concerns about 1636 as written. Moya was created as a mayoral office by referendum in 2001. Since then, it has served the nearly 40% of New Yorkers who are immigrants and 60% their children. I strongly believe that immigrant inclusion and integration is res the responsibility of the entire city, not just one agency. 
The model that we have found to be the most effective is having Moya consult with myriad city agencies to make sure that serving immigrants is a major aspect of their work. This way we can influence, improve, and leverage existing infrastructures without inefficiently recreating uh, programs or structures that exist elsewhere in the administration. While we concur with the need for resources and services to best serve immigrant New Yorkers, we do not believe that it makes sense to, to spend resources to build out the necessary infrastructure for our department when we can utilize existing resources elsewhere. Our current agency partners take very seriously the role of ensuring that all New Yorkers can access their services. And many agencies do have immigrant-specific bureaus as examples. DSS HRA has an Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs, and similarly, ACS has an Office of Immigrant Services and Language Affairs. Both of these offices are crucial partners in ensuring access to services for immigrant New Yorkers with the specific mission of ensuring that the programs overseen by those agencies are incorporating the needs of immigrants. We do believe the additional institutionalization and formalization of Moya's role could be helpful. For example, the charter includes language about Moya's role in enhancing access to benefits, but does not include language about empowering immigrants with information about their rights. This is work that Moya does and which fits into our shared goals of empowerment and civic engagement. Similarly, Moya conducts qualitative and quantitative research alongside the Mayor's Office of Economic Opportunity and the Department of City Planning, and has published several fact sheets about the impact of certain policy and legal changes in New York City immigrant communities. Working alongside our partner agencies to improve our understanding of immigrant New Yorkers, the trends we see, their needs, and the impacts of their immigration status or English proficiency on reaching their fullest potential has been critical to our work. Finally, given the nature of immigration and the degree to which it has relevance and import at the federal level, being within the mayor's office has further enlightened us to the advantage of speaking from City Hall. It is without a doubt a critical means by which we have been able to wield the power of the administration, both internally and externally, in a time when it is necessary to engage in nimble and swift action to fight for our values alongside immigrant New Yorkers. I look forward to continuing our discussion of this proposal with the council. Thank you for the opportunity to testify with these, about these bills, and I look forward to the additional conversations. I'm happy to take any questions and look forward to working with you. Thank you, thank you, Commissioner, for your your testimony and for uplifting the work that, that we're doing together. And and another bill is really kind of focused on some of the the kind of administrative relationship. And but it's an important discussion. And I just want to go through the bills really quick, just to understand that essentially the concerns, the kind of greater concerns, are coming with Intro 1636 that are asking for an agency to be created. The 1835, 1844 are here for further discussions. So mm -hmm. We can have further discussions. Yep. There's no yay or nay, but just more discussions about what that means. And then 1836 is a go. Uh, you've been working on similar uh, uh, administrative code changes, and so we're, we're ready to kind of move forward on that. And with the state issues, we'll figure that out. As yeah, we we'll figure hit. out the legal issues, okay. but that's great. it. Great, yep. thank you, thank you for that. Uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Councilmember Drum to, to really begin the discussion on what will be probably the more difficult discussion yep. in terms of the, 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 the visions that we sure. are sharing. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Councilmember Drum. I don't know how difficult I'll be, but uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the discussion is a challenge, yes. uh, and, and it's all yours. Anyway, um, you know, the purpose in, in, in me reading uh, the successes that we have had under this administration, as opposed to the previous administration, was to highlight uh, some of the things that we have done that I think have had such a positive impact on our immigrant communities, and one that I fear if we don't have the current administration, we may lose uh, moving forward in, uh, with, other, um, with other administrations to come, especially with what's happening in Washington, D.C. at this moment. Yeah. So I honestly don't understand or get, um, and it's probably maybe because I, I'm not in the administration, 
but um, how being a department would prohibit you from doing some of the things that you mentioned in your testimony. So for example, you say the model that we have found most effective is having Moya consult with the myriad agencies to make sure that serving immigrants is a major aspect of their work. It still would be possible, wouldn't it, for uh, a department to uh, work with those agencies? For sure. I guess I'd say a couple of things. I'd say um, it matters, for better or worse, right, externally and internally, to be able to convene as a mayoral office, to call on others internally and externally um, from that position or vantage point, and to be able to use the infrastructure that exists across it to drive the work. Um, and I think to your point, which is a sound one, council member, about the fact that there's just I mean, you can't compare this administration to the last when it re as to immigration, right? And that has so much to do with leadership in the council, leadership in the administration, and leadership within this office itself. So, like, if I actually had to connect the dots on what makes the work grow and what makes it successful, that's where I would point, right? I don't actually, I, and so then if I'm picking, if I, if that, with that reality or landscape in mind, if I'm saying, okay, if you have those things in place, where are you more effective? You know, this has been like a very, I've really tried to grapple with this. I've talked to a lot of people and tried to inform myself both like structurally, what does it take to establish a department? How does that shift our work? Does it make us more strategic, more advantageous? Does it institutionalize the work in any other real way? And I can, consistently am met with no, like you are more effective than many departments, right? And that has a lot to do with the commitment and the buy-in to the work and who the leaders are and less to do with where we're situated. And so from my vantage point, if that's true, where we're situated has been hugely critical in driving the work. Um, but that, that commissioner is actually my concern. It is because of the work that you've been able to accomplish and the work of this administration that we've been able to do so much. My fear is that if the next administration has a, um, a commissioner for immigration that isn't as committed or as committed in the same way that this administration has been, um, then we will lose the benefit of the work that we have done or already accomplished. And I haven't understood that to be true, but I would appreciate like further, further conversation with you to understand what the difference would be. So from my, what I have seen, there's been cuts at departments, right? It, for varying reasons or that haven't been prioritized. And I have actually seen benefit in being within the mayor's office in being able to prioritize or drive issues. So. I haven't seen the other side of that coin. I, I think in my mind, the, uh, the idea of a department carries more weight than simply a office of, uh, mayor's office of immigrant affairs. I, I think that knowing that there's an actual department um, it, with our chair, our current chair, he has held budget hearings um, uh, during the preliminary and I believe during the executive as well. But when I was immigration chair, we didn't have that, mm -hmm. and the reason used for that was because it wasn't a department. And so we constantly had to fight for funding, and, and the only reason I think we've gotten to the level of where we have funding now is because of the interaction that we have all had. And that makes me worry that if in fact it's not a department, and the priority of the next administration isn't so much on immigrant, immigrants, that then they can cut budgets without even the public or the immigration chair really even knowing moving forward. So I hear, I hear that, and I think you hear from, I hope you hear from me today a commitment to trying to address those concerns or challenges. I think uh, certainly I won't be here with the establishment of something like this. So this isn't a personal, um, what would I prefer? It is really substantively, I think we have the same, same goal of thinking about how this work lives past all of us, right? Um, in the most effective way. And I, I have a commitment to ensuring that the transparency is where it needs to be and to improving on that and working with you to do that. Because I understand that. Um, and I think that that's a fair thing to raise. Um, I think, though, to your point of ensuring that the work 
remains and is institutionalized. I think that was part of the purpose of the bills that we've worked together to pass right over the course of the last six years. Um, institutionalizing Moy's oversight role over language access through legislation, institutional excuse me, institutionalizing our role over immigration enforcement, right, and how city agencies are responding to those requests through local law 228, creating or carving a role for us to work with the chief privacy officer as it relates to privacy considerations or access to property questions expanding the legislative role of the office so that actually another agency can't come in and say, no, there isn't work in that office that deals with federal or state policies, right? And I think there are ways to continue to do that. I'm not yet convinced that we would actually establish the goals I think we both have if it were a department. So if another department were to say that's a role that we can't allow you to involve yourself in, that, that happens within Sorry. the administ that would happen within the administration if there's an issue with, let's say, Department of Transportation versus DEP. You know, oftentimes there's similar issues, related issues, you know, paving of a road versus uh, water main break or whatever. Those agencies work together even though they're di different departments. Of course. No, I'm not suggesting that. I think I'm saying the convening power and the influence power and the fact that, from my perspective, a huge part of the because, role of an office like this is Because it comes directly from the mayor? It, well, it's, yeah, it's, com it's coming from the mayor's office and city hall, and we're getting in the weeds of other agencies' <laughs> practices and policies, which I think agencies have, you know, I think we've done an I've been very appreciative to the willingness for folks to allow us to play the role that we do, but as you can imagine, um, it is a little bit of like a big brother looking over <laughs> your shoulder sometimes, and I think it's helpful to be able to have the backing of City Hall in doing that work. All right. um, one of the key ways in which the city provides direct services to immigrant New Yorkers is through a large portfolio of social and legal services, as we've been discussing, primarily administrated, but through HRA and DSS. So would the administration of these contracts change if, there was, um, if they were to be uh, rehomed in the Department of Immigrant Affairs? Our understanding is that there would be both legal and operational um, challenges to those contracts, yes. Can you elaborate further on that? What would that um, be? I think this is something that we're starting to try, you know, with the introduction of this bill to better understand, but have heard concerns of uh, needing to establish new contracts if there were to be a new department that we would have oversight over. So in terms of that discussion, it reminds me of similar discussions that the council had with um, the uh, mayor's office of uh, veterans affairs versus the creation of the department of veterans affairs. Have you communicated at all with the department of veterans affairs? We have. Okay. Yes. So that's been part of your discussion in it terms has. of looking at what might have to happen if in fact a department of immigrant affairs was to be yeah, created. Yeah, but I but I would reiterate again here what I noted in the testimony which I don't think is insignificant is um you know my and I think your shared um kind of year to year goals has been that we are increasing the resources going into our communities and the work itself and I think that the if the necessary resources to actually create the physical infrastructure of the department are not insignificant. Um, whereas the way that we work now or operate now is we're able to be a little bit more nimble because we're, we're working with agencies to better suit their infrastructures to doing this work, but playing a role in that. So I think that it's not, it is, it, it is important and there should be continued work on making sure that agencies are best able to do this work and to do so effectively. Um, and I think from, as I said, from my perspective, if I could be, pers if I'm persuaded strategically that going in the department direction is the way to go, I would still be concerned that now you're, at, you're talking about a lot of new resources to build an infrastructure for a department um, to happen instead of those resources going where I would like them to go with services and programs. Um, how many staff does Moya currently have? 
Um, so I appreciate the question and know that this is an area of where we can improve upon in terms of transparency. And um, we have spoken internally and we look forward to being able to sit down with you and try and address this in uh, a better way and be more responsive to these questions. So we're happy to do that with you after this. And can we talk about how many are on detail versus uh, how many are borrowed um, from other departments? Yes. Okay. Um, and why do you separate that out? Why are those arrangements made? Um, why are they made? Right, that you have some that are on detail and others that are borrowed. Um, we don't have borrowed staff. No? We do not, no. Okay. But you do have on detail? We don't have on detail? I don't think so either. They're not termed that way? Mm-mm. Okay. Well, let's make sure that we yeah. discuss that. That's okay. why I want to make sure that we're responsive. <laughs> Um, so, um, the, the resourcing of current uh, Moya is wholly dependent on the mayor's prioritization of such an office. Should there come a time when a mayor seeks to deprioritize immigrant issues, how might those resources be allocated uh, to the current Moya change? So if, 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 if a mayor were not to um, fully fund it as it's being funded now, or if it, even if we may even believe that now is not fully funded or as much funded as we'd like to see, but what would happen to those to the funding? How would it be separated out? Would it be moved? I mean, can you envision any scenario where that would happen, or what would happen to the programs that are already in place? It is hard to um, envision that, mostly because I think uh, the. As I said before, I think that the commitment to the, the programs, I mean, most of it is programming, right? The ma vast majority of the resources and the funding are programming from IDNYC to Action NYC uh, to We Speak New York. And so those are, are things that we, certainly IDNYC and Action NYC, we feel have longevity and, and support because people use the programs, right? And they're championed and that is not just from us, but from you all and community members and others. And so I think uh, it's, a, and, and part of the goal of bringing Action NYC into the uh, Office of Civil Justice is so that all the immigration legal services contracts live in one place and you can literally see uh, all the resources that are there and be uh, mindful of sort of what the needs is if they're already cut. So I don't see what you're forecasting, but I definitely am trying to better understand and ensure we're protecting against that. So oh, do you feel it would be correct for me to state that you feel that the Department of Immigrant Affairs wouldn't insulate the concerns of immigrant New Yorkers from future political whims? I don't see a difference. Um, I haven't, but I am open to continued conversation to ensure that we're not missing anything. Um, I think that the council's passage of the legislation that expands the role of the office and the work mandated for the office to do is critical um, and important in ensuring that, right? Um, and I think that we certainly, I certainly I feel strongly that we have a shared vision in the work, right? And making sure that it's as effective and productive as possible, and that includes re resources not just for us, but for agencies to do the work, right? So um, I think let's continue this conversation um, and certainly uh, appreciate and value that this is something that we all wanna see continue and live on beyond us in the most effective way possible. Okay, so the 2017 language access law requires that all city agencies uh, develop and implement language access plans and to thus be responsible for the provision of language access to their constituencies within the framework of the laid, that's laid out in the law. At the same time, Moya is directed to monitor language access provision across agencies. This is an example in which responsibility to serve uh, limited English proficient New Yorkers is shared by individual agencies and by Moya. How would this work change if Moya were to become a Department of Immigrant Affairs? So that one's an interesting one because we actually share that oversight role with Mayor's Office of Operations, right? And we have found that to be really important. We bring different skills and expertise to that engagement with agencies. And so we see that as a partnership that shouldn't change because we've seen the value add in having uh, their, their staff work alongside our staff and doing that oversight work. Okay. 
I think that's it for now, um, and I thank you for your, for your time. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Drum. We've been joined by Councilmember Moya, uh, Francisco Moya from Queens, and I want to I want to uh, review some questions and follow-ups from some of the conversation that happened with you and Councilmember Drum. Uh, I want to start with some basics. You know, I I I want to be as open-minded as possible in this discussion because it is transformational in a lot of ways, and and I hear you speak about the power that you are wielding in terms of the connections, and, and that's compelling. Uh, what also is compelling is this concept of transparency and you admitting here in front of us that it's been difficult, uh, the conversation around staff and not, not being able to answer that here has not just been the first time, this has been a continual conversation where we are met with no information. And these are the kind of things that are, are difficult for us to build policies around and when we work with constituents and organizations those are the kind of things that make it frustrating difficult and really begin to tarnish the brand of of true immigrant fighters across the board they look to us with disappointment and they look to you with disappointment and the mayor really the mayor and so those are the kind of things that are really at the center and the core of this discussion and how we move through that with a longer history ahead of us where we can really codify in an agency work the commitment to immigrants. No one is saying that, that you're not committed in the work that you do, and I've, and I've seen you at work. The question is not for you, it's really for the future of this city. And this city has been run by mayors that are not friendly to the immigrant community, even with its history that both Councilmember Drum and I spoke to. And that's the, that's the work here. So can you define what, what, it, what is an agency to you as the mayor's office? Like what, what is an agency? I'm sorry, I'm not, what, what do you mean? Can you define what a department is? What I mean, is a department? I, I would maybe ask you to do it in converse. I think that the challenge that I've had in going through this exercise is trying to better understand the value add um, in the creation of a department versus keeping us where we are, but continuing to um, be thoughtful in the work of the office and its responsibilities and codifying that through legislation or otherwise, right? I don't, I haven't seen the, the value add as being greater than keeping us in, in this situation. And to your point, and I said this myself, it's really not about me because I won't really be here when such a thing is, is created. And so I certainly have not been looking at it from a personal point of view, but rather a strategic one in what I've witnessed in doing the work over the course of the last six years and how the work is done across you know, the city um, and the import of actually being able to represent the mayor, which you are really doing when you're a mayoral office, both within communities, which it's important, communities who've never had a mayor's office come and speak to them or care about them or value their point of view or want to ensure that we're serving them and, and helping build their power, to being able to sit in a congressional office from the mayor's office and as a spokesperson from City Hall to say, this is the position of, this, of the city of New York as it relates to immigrant communities and immigrant values. That has not been something I've taken lightly and it has allowed me to do my work better. And I think within the Trump administration, it's actually further enshrined the value of it. Well, and, and I think to maybe to your point that we we're actually, we're, we're doing our best here to define what an agency is in, um, in many ways. And, and so we will do that in the coming days and even through this hearing is to define for you what it means to have an agency and the power of an agency. And so maybe the definition and the understanding of an agency really comes and can be informed by conflicts that we have had in the past in terms of how we have been at different sides of conversation. And so maybe before I go into any specifics, how does the mayor resolve conflict with agencies right now? And you being in the mayor's office, you're kind of in the space where you've seen maybe a potential conflict with a, with a department head, a commissioner of a department of education or the department of 
uh, homeless services or DIFTA, et cetera. How have you seen the mayor make uh, or resolve conflict? I have not. I can't speak for his approach to, I certainly can't speak for the mayor in this regard or his approach with other agencies. I have witnessed and seen myself treated with equal amounts of respect and uh, authority as my sister or brother commissioners. I have not, by any stretch of the imagination, seen uh, my own role or my role as a commissioner within a mayor's office versus a department be diminished. In fact, in some cases, I have stronger relationships across City Hall, and so I don't, in that regard, I, I don't, I'm not sure I can be more responsive than what I just said. I'll bring an example that has been a continued sore spot for all of us in terms of the decision that the mayor has made unilaterally to remove the ability for everyone to have access to legal services uh, that do not include the uh, um, the detainer the detainer law uh, crimes, and this has been this is kind of this larger conversation about due process, and that's something that the mayor gets to decide and has power over his agencies to kind of impact. And part of part of what I think what we're that that's an example of where a mayor has kind of gone above and beyond to make a decision that I think has been not necessarily felt across the board and an example of where a mayor can kind of go above and beyond and make a decision that's unilateral and has the power to do that. Agencies would then have the ability to kind of, we can hold them accountable through the budget process and, and other ways that would allow for further discussion. But that's, that's, a, that's an example, so I just want to kind of give an example sure. of, of where we just haven't been connected in terms of values and, and strategy. And what, we're, what I think we're saying is, in a moment where a mayor decides not to go and move forward in the policy that is being driven by a city council or by the people, that an agency could be more compelled to be able to have transparency and oversight over a question about access to services. I would disagree entirely with the premise of the question. So okay. first off, as it relates. Well, please. <laughs> as it relates. Lay that out for us. <laughs> As it relates to the issue that you raise, let me remind you that those contracts are administered by HRA, the Office of Civil Justice, and actually what I articulated was the goal in consolidating all immigration legal services contracts within that office. Um, and so I don't, that, that. But with the direction of the mayor, the, ma the mayor has made that direction. Again, the off not administered by Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, administered by the Department of Social Services. I don't think, and I hope, that nobody sees myself or Commissioner Banks as ones who don't uh, use our voices and <laughs> leadership to drive the values that we have and share. And of course, I think that there's, uh, there's import for that conversation and discussion, but there is transparency of those contracts, where they are and what provisions they hold. I don't see if your point is aiming at that there's greater ability for a department head to push back versus the commissioner of immigrant affairs i would disagree entirely okay and that's helpful and again that's, that helps understand yeah. how the relationship with the mayor's office has with the city agencies and maybe there's no power there that a commissioner will have in a department so it just kind of goes to show that really there is no extra power that a de department has if the mayor decides that he wants to carve out access to legal services for people who have certain crime, uh, uh, then that's at his, so that's, that's instructive here in this discussion. Have you spoken to other pr prior commissioners about this question and, and who have you spoken to? Sure, um, I have spoken to my immediate predecessor um, who shared this point of view, of course, um, Commissioner Agarwal, um, and I have actually reached out and engaged to engage with um, the prior commissioners who are, are both away at this time, um, but we will, we will engage and talk about it. I will say the work of this office under this administration has a striking difference, right, from prior administrations, and again, emphasize that that has to do with leadership and who cares about this work and who values and prioritizes it. I have yet to hear an argument that I think is persuasive that it changes 
changes or shifts depending on whether it's an office or department? No, it shifts because of the mayor. Yeah. That's, and I think that's Leader, the point. No, no, leadership. Yeah, Bra- not, I think not leadership an agency matters. or mayor's office. It's a, it's a shift that we're trying to anticipate in the future. No, I'm, going, I'm, saying, I'm saying the exact opposite of that. Okay, so explain or re, uh, Articulate restate it. Yeah, your, restate your it. point. Um, I'm saying that I've yet to hear an argument that it, um, the ability to shift prioritization or issues changes from the mayoral office to a department uh, in a way that I think is persuasive. So, for example, the reason I think that you've seen such success in the work in this work mm-hmm. is because of the commitment across leadership. Um, but that, if, that if we were a department, I don't think that would have we would have grown if we didn't have that commitment. For example, so like say we were a department when we came into office in 2015. Um, would that have radically changed, say, and say none, not the speaker, not you all, not myself, not the mayor cared about immigration, would we have seen the kind of focus or commitment that we've seen? No, right? <laughs> so I think the whole package and context is what matters, and I haven't been able to understand but can appreciate continued conversations how just this, the mere change from the, the office to the department actually changes that equation. Yeah, and I, and I think the, the the disconnect here is that we're not we're, we're speaking to a, the context that changes after an administration changes. The city council is about to shift completely. Leadership is going to be different, and what we're trying to do is codify that commitment. And if it takes a few more steps, if it takes a few more pillars that that need to be constructed, yeah, then we are saying that we should consider that. Yeah, and that I appreciate that, that, for sure. And I think that, as I said, the, all of the legislation that's been passed that codifies the work of the office, I think, is hugely helpful and important. And so I want to continue those conversations. OK, I'm going to pause your questions. And actually, what I want to do is, is ask uh, Councilmember Moya to uh, read any statement that he has on his bill. Okay, well, I, I'm gonna hand it over to you to do a couple things. Questions, and then uh, give us any kind of insight about the bill. Uh, you might have her, uh, Commissioner Mustofi's testimony, but all green lights there. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, and, and I might have missed, and I apologize uh, for coming here late. But w- would this allow to have borough commissioners Allow you to have borough commissioners? Yeah, so if you're going from, you're saying from an office to a department, right? Mm-hmm. Would this then allow you to uh, bring in borough commissioners? I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure I'm, I'm even fully, you mean like staff that can be representative within each borough? I mean, we have that, right? Not commissioners. I think that's where you threw me a little bit. But we have, we have staff that are um, uh, responsible, if you will, for working across different communities that are immigrant-dense communities um, and being representative of the needs of those communities. So if you look at, and, I, and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, to cut you off, but if, if you look at the Department of Transportation and other departments, they have borough commissioners. Sure. And so that's why I'm asking if you're shifting would that be what you would also be bringing in? I am open. I well, so it's not my bill. It's Councilmember Drum's just- bill. But I and I certainly have ideas of what I think works and um, what I think should be continued past us um, and built upon. I think that's that might, that might, is an idea certainly and one that we should look at and consider. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Do you want to make a statement? I'll just make a quick, please. I'll read my statement. Uh, Thank you, uh, Chairman Chaka, and to the uh, Immigration Committee staff. Uh, I introduced uh, this bill because words matter, uh, and the language we use or choose to use has power and consequences. Uh, It can be used to educate, empower, and unite people, or conversely, to dehumanize and divide us. Uh, That's why I've personally implemented certain community guidelines at my public forums, including specifically on social media platforms. I decided no longer to allow comments that characterize human beings as illegals, a legally meaningless term, uh, a piece of hate speech that's deployed only to intimidate and otherwise not just undocumented immigrants, uh, but often legal residents. 
Uh, it's time for the city to retire uh, another term, and that's alien. The word alien appears repeatedly in the city charter and administrative code. Uh, this is an outdated and loaded term. Its definition is non-citizen, which is a perfectly clear word that doesn't need to hide behind a euphemism. It therefore uh, has no business existing in our administrative code or city charter. Uh, this bill would replace the term alien with non-citizen wherever it refers to non-citizens in the city charter and administrative code and would prohibit the city from using the term alien, illegal alien, or illegal immigrant in laws, documents, or materials unless referencing a federal law or program. Uh, but this, is, this isn't just about replacing one word with another. It's about treating the individuals these terms describe as full human beings. Uh, and with that, uh, I just wanted to uh, thank you um, all for being here, and I would like to encourage uh, you all to uh, support Intro 1636, and now I would turn it back to uh, Chairman Chaka. Thank you. I'd just love to briefly respond, because Council Member, you weren't here when I spoke, but we are thrilled that, to see this um, legislation proposed. We have, it's something that we've actually been working on with the City Human Rights Commission, so we hope to expand upon your proposal in looking at other ways, other language to change within the city's human rights law, um, and we look forward to working with you on it, so thank you. Thank you. There are some other bills as well, and I'm glad that there's a lot of alignment there, and I think we're all ready to move forward, so we're looking forward to sitting down and, and really hammering out the next steps on those pieces of legislation. Uh, that are presented both by uh, Councilmember Moya and Lewis. Okay. So uh, I, I might want to just pause and, and make a, a, a statement and move over to the other bills, 1844 and uh, 36. But the, the, I guess the conversation here, we're, we're at, a, we're at a, a standstill in some ways about what we're, we're speaking to in terms of the, the real value that we're trying to bring into this conversation with codifying, building an agency that can be held accountable. The history of this, and, and Councilmember Drum mentioned this, that the, the concept of a budget hearing was new, and that came after Melissa Mark Viverito was um, elected by her peers as, as speaker, and the mayor came in, and, and so it, it worked. There's, there's no reason why someone, and even now, the, the, the mayor can say, we're not gonna wanna have a budget hearing with all of you because it's not, a, it's, it, there is, a, there is a, an argument to be made that there is no agency and therefore there's no need for uh, a hearing. And we'll fight back, of course, and that's not where we are right now, but there, there is reason today for even that to happen. And so an agency, just on that alone, the budget oversight has been critical in growing those numbers of dollars, sometimes without even getting that request from you. We think that there's more money that needs to happen, and because of, and especially in my opening remarks, immigrants who are being impacted, when we think about healthcare, it's an immigrant issue, housing is an immigrant issue, transportation is an immigrant issue, that, that we, we, we must build infrastructure to, to permeate every parts of it. So everything from, from a commissioner that can be held accountable by the charter to bring through a, a, a budget to be reviewed transparently is, is a positive thing. The borough concepts of, of, of offices in the, every, every borough, and every borough is different in terms of what populations exist. Those are all kind of things that even now when we ask about staff, we don't even get that from you. Those are the things that are not just frustrating, but I think are super concerning and flags that could be solved by an agency. And, and so while there may be risks that you are presenting that I think are compelling, the ultimate goal here is to codify our commitment to our immigrant community that is not a side dish. This is the main course for the city as it moves forward in possible dark economic times. And it is immigrants who are gonna take us through that and so that, those are the kind of things that are, are, I think, part of our conversations internally and why, why we support this discussion and why we're gonna be very forceful as we move forward to get those questions answered as we make a final decision. Sure. Good. Okay. I don't think we're a side dish is the only comment I have, but go ahead. No, I, I, <laughs> yeah. not, no well, not you, but immigrants <laughs> and, and how we can really make sure that we bring it to the core of every discussion and, and we think this is a way to go. Now, Intro 1844. So as I mentioned in the statement, my opening statement, the purpose of Moya's annual report is to provide clear snapshots of the immigrant population that calls the city home. 
to identify the barriers that they face and to demonstrate a clear data-informed approach to programmatic initiatives that tackle the barriers identified. One goal of this legislation is to codify a connection between the data reported in the annual report and the programmatic work conducted by Moya, alone and in partnership. Loan and a partnership. So here's an illustration of Moya's annual report from calendar year 2018. On pages 12 to 13, there's, a data, there's data on the LEP foreign-born population and the languages that they speak. On pages 23 to 24, there is an analysis of the linguistic isolation among children living in mixed status families. This clearly identifies literacy issues and barriers, and that is an important first step. What the report does not make clear, however, is which Moya's programs address these specific issues and barriers. The report includes a sec section on We Speak NYC, which states that in an English language learning ELL, ELL program, but the program data included the classes organized, students engaged, and volunteers trained does not address the issues and barriers identified in a meaningful way or measurable way. For adult literacy classes, it would be more helpful to know how many adults signed up for those classes, attended those classes, completed those classes, signed up for additional classes, any skill level gains, educational attainment, and employment outcomes. That way success or failure could be measured. And I realize that the failure can be scary to admit, but for the sake of our accountability to taxpayers, it is our, our responsibility to know if a program is not working. The data will help us see if we see it, uh, if we need to dedicate existing resources elsewhere. Lastly, it would be helpful to see recommendations based on those metrics. The recommendations section of the last annual report does not have any recommendations related to literacy. That said, I'll start with these two questions. How does the bill ensure that the needs of immigrant New Yorkers are accurately, accurately described? And then two, how does the bill ensure that the, more, the, more, the important work Moya conducts is contextualized within the landscape that I just described? The bill or the report? The report. Um, the report, yeah. So, sorry, give me the first question again. So the, the language that ensures that the need of immigrant New Yorkers are accurately described. So I kind of walked you through the, the kind of discrepancy and gap of understanding that could lead to uh, another space of adult literacy. Like we just, we, we have different ideas about adult literacy and how we go there. Data that I'm describing does not exist could actually help us solve some of the policy issues around adult literacy where we can really kind of move further. NICAL comes every year with new ideas and how we do that, but we're still kind of stuck in this discussion about adult literacy. How much adult literacy need do we have in, in the city sure. and the kind of particular communities that are impacted? Those are things that we would like to see in the annual report, things that Moya is working on. And so that's, that's the kind of question that, that this bill particularly is, is speaking to. So speaking from that example, I'll say a couple of things. First off, as it relates to the report, and you noted this in your introduction, the um, bill that passed to create the report only had the first report be in 2017, right? We're talking about a report that's less than two years old, and we're talking about data that was presented in that report that actually was never previously even published, let alone something that was utilized um, across sort of city government and otherwise. And so I think I first want to start by stating how important I think that that is, um, that it exists, um, that there be a report that's dedicated to looking at that, but also commending the teams that have made it happen. I, I don't, I feel sometimes that it, there is a lack of understanding or appreciation for just how much um, hard work, innovation, and creativity is done not just by my team, but my team working in conjunction with the uh, Mayor's Office for Economic Opportunity um, to publish a methodology that looked at even how you get to uh, undocumented population and then leveraged that methodology to provide all of the statistical data that we put in that report. We actually had 
none of this infrastructure, none of this staff, none of this work that existed in the office before two years ago. And I think I just want to emphasize, I appreciate and always emphasize with every, across my team and with others that we're constantly iterating and building on the work, but just how great an accomplishment that is in so short a period of time. Um, and it's been iterated on, I mean, there's just two reports, right? And we had the very first conversation with you all even about the report just this summer, much of that feedback being incorporated in the report that we're going to do for the next year. And I think wanting to be realistic about what is the tool that we're creating through this report, whereas what exists elsewhere and being mindful and thoughtful about not re you know, creating new wheels or duplicating efforts. We've had lots of conversations, for example, about literacy, right? And we took many, many, many steps over a very long period of time to ensure that there was actually an office in the administration that was focused on literacy more broadly, and that's the Office for Workforce Development, who has within its scope of purview, and we work closely with them now, but in the last year, right, looking at literacy, understanding the questions that you have presented, right, is part of what they're doing. Um, and we uh, felt very strongly that that, you, when you look at limited English prof proficient New Yorkers, that that's not just immigrant New Yorkers, actually, right? Um, but also that it's important that the that there be, and we agree, right, that there be like an office that's actually looking at and responsible for literacy programming across the administration. So from everything from the Department of Education to the Department for Youth and Community Development to our work with We Speak, et cetera, um, in an umbrella of better understanding. And we've talked about, we're working with CUNY on a broader report to understand that spectrum of service across agencies um, and to better evaluate it. That is different than looking at We Speak, right, alone, or looking at the successes or failures of that program alone. That work should happen, and we should be a part of it, and we should be mindful of it, and refer to it, right? But it's not what we have reported on in the report when it relates to that specific program. And we have evaluated the We Speak program, I think, as you know. Less than two years ago, we presented uh, to you and to your team and the council staff that evaluation, um, so because it, it helps inform the work that we do with that program, and we took from that evaluation some learnings of what was working and what wasn't, <laughs> um, and we from that built out uh, a web infrastructure that we've built upon even further this year to give people tools that they can use at home. Um, so they're not dependent upon coming to a class because we have learned that many of our communities work and it's actually hard for them to make the classes and we need to be more mindful of how, people, how learning is happening in the broader education field and that's often actually online. So that's where we've been focused. And so I think there are many, many, many ways to do uh, the work that you're describing and we take very seriously um, the import of uh, making sure that there is the right entity or agency that's looking at the umbrella view and understanding what our role is within that um, and can, can speak further with you about how to either reference that work or be cognizant of it through the report where there's value to it. And, and, and we see that value. And, and I'd want to just reiterate that I, when, when I think about the accomplishments and the work that you are connected to, the report is one of them, and we appreciate that. We are all we're trying to do is make the report better, and that includes just data and information and transparency. And, and so this is, where, this is where it's coming from in terms of how we make that. And so we have sat down, and we're going to continue to sit down. And that's why these bills, I think, really require the, the a kind of programmatic reporting to use industry standard metrics. And I think that's the, the other piece that we have spoken to that that allow allow, especially in the nonprofit sector, to kind of look at this information with us and examine that. That's our job, the oversight job, and and we want that to ma be made available. And we know that this is a pioneering work. This is your second. You've had two annual reports, and and we know that this is the beginning of a kind of evolution yeah. of this work. And so we, we appreciate that too. Uh, this was a legal mandate by the, by the city council to kind of do that. 
which kind of shows where, where we're at and making sure that, that there's legal framework. Moya offers a range of programs from legal services uh, and referrals through Action NYC to language access. And can you talk a little bit about, a bit about those metrics that are currently used to measure program success? And how closer are you getting to the industry standard metrics? I mean, I think this is a question that we have for you and the staff. What do you mean when you say industry standard metrics? That certainly we don't think there's we're a, not. There's a. Sure, but I think we should have this conversation. I think that there, from our perspective, certainly there are different ways of looking at how you approach evaluation and not, not and we would define or think that they fall under the definition of in industry standard metrics. And so I think it's just making sure that we're aligned. By way of example, we didn't think the way we cited to our methodology was wrong, but you would like to see it cited to in a different way. So we can do that, that's not a big deal. But I think we should sit down and have that conversation to make sure we are at least clear that we're talking about the same thing and then make decisions from there. Okay, and look, I'm, I'm not a researcher, so I, I, don't, I don't know, but I know that what we have been briefed on and, and made aware of, that there, there are industry standard metrics that can be helpful in actually trying to figure out how to sure. build policy, new legislation, yep. and solve the literacy piece, the legal, legal standards piece, mixed status families and how they engage education. So I'm, and I'm relying on, on our team to, to help inform me and the broader community of advocates that are with us often. And they're the ones that build our legislative agenda in so many ways. How many of the additional provisions in this legislation, the 1844, are wholly new or onerous to the established ways in which Moya internally tracks information or, and or prepares data for the annual report? We, we kind of outlined that in 1844 about what kind of things that we want mm -hmm. and how many of those things are you feeling like just go kind of above and beyond and are onerous in any way? I mean, I'd like to get back to you on that one and go back and look um, okay. and sort of see what feels like excessive and maybe not as useful or helpful as other things. What about data that, we, that you're not collecting right now that, that will be, well, I mean, if if you can speak to that, if there's anything that kind of pops out about stuff that you're not collecting right now that we're asking you to collect. Stuff that we're not collecting that you're asking us to collect? Correct. Nothing comes to my mind at the moment. Um, I don't know if you're speaking to a specific example that you have, but I don't. Uh, if there are, I'll get them to you. Um, let's, let's move to 1835. 1835, can you describe the administration's goals and visions for the interagency task force? Um, you did that a lot, actually, in the report. The work that we're asking is for more transparency. Mm -hmm. Some of the stuff that we ask on in interagency is, is not a micromanaging kind of request. It's really to start to build out agendas that are understood and allow for voice that that is different. Agent interagency conversations are going to be happening whether or not we ask you to do it or not. That's just it's a natural thing for the administration to kind of speak through these things. But we're asking for something very different. And the vision for the interagency conversation and our now our request to have a co-chair to really develop an agenda that speaks to the stuff that we think are important, maybe the gaps that are coming out of public hearings can be co-generated by a co-chair. Uh, council appointed co-chair and how does that shift and is that a is that a um, is that a departure from what you understand an uh, interagency task force to be I mean the only thing I heard you say that was specific was having a co-chair but what do you mean co-chair with with very specific roles and responsibilities setting agenda uh, really kind of being present and and having discussion among the multiple areas. But that doesn't speak to your goals for the task force, so if you could be more specific or clear on what you mean there. Well, it's about transparency, one. Uh, two, a kind of timely, periodic meeting, and that it happens, and that, that we can kind of be part of that. Discussions that might be coming out of those, um, or uh, policy conversations that come out of this might lead to legislation or, or budget or budget impacts. And so for, for us, we think about this as, as a, the value of what the interagency 
task force could have been but is not today. And this is part of the, the kind of drive to change the way that the interagency task force works. Sure. So I'll say a couple of things there. I think um, first I'll start with the work that we've done and sort of the way that we see the work of the task force moving forward. Um, I'd say first off, as it relates to frequency, I know again that this is a less than two year old task force. Um, that it actually didn't take in, take effect until late 2018, and actually in 2018 we we met two times, even though it didn't go into effect until later. And last year we met three times, and I think we've actually stated that we have the goal of meeting quarterly, but want to be conscientious of the fact that we work very closely with many, many, many of the agencies within the task force separately, and that's part of actually what happened last year. We worked so much with so many of those agencies on public charge that the frequency of the meeting, we thought three was sufficient um, in terms of driving some of the agenda that we had across interagency work. Um, so I don't actually think we have a difference of opinion in terms of the frequency. I, don't, I do actually think there should be flexibility um, to what that is, which is what currently exists in the legislation, um, that there is a, a requirement for meeting regularly, but that there's no mandate that it must be four versus three. I'm not sure that that's wise necessarily to advance work. Um, in terms of the goals of the task force, I spoke a lot about this in the testimony, um, and I think more broadly even in terms of the vision of the work of an Office of Immigrant Affairs in general, right? So I think Critically, and you noted this as well, you live in a city where the work of every single one of our agencies is impacting immigrant New Yorkers. When you talk about the needs of immigrant New Yorkers, they include, as you said, all of the, all of the above, right? And so for us, that, and again, this sort of speaks to, do you invest more resources in the infrastructure of a department or do you invest within the agencies so that they can do this work more effectively? And we really believe you have to, you do a little bit of both, but certainly you invest in the agencies to do this work better. We've seen how the sheer advantage that is created with the administrative, um, administration for children's services and actually having a dedicated office with dedicated staff that's actually responsible for doing, to bringing that immigration lens to the work of that agency, because it's very different when you're in the day-to-day building your expertise of the work of the agency and how it serves immigrant New Yorkers um, and working alongside your colleagues in doing that than having an outside officer or department kind of come into your, your work, right? I, I, I've seen the value out of that be so tremendous that a part of the vision that we've brought to the task force is how do you develop that within the task force members to serve that role within their agencies more effectively so that it doesn't require us hearing from you or from an advocate or a constituent that something isn't going as it should be, but that there's actually staff that's dedicated to doing that work and working with the agencies and its programs and policies on a continuous basis to do that work. Um, so we have constructed some of the goals of the office around essentially building that muscle within agencies. How do they approach the work in creating policies and drafting their own uh, rules in creating or piloting their own programs that center the questions that we would bring to the table without us even being there, right? Um, what tools do we need to create so that they can go there first and not necessarily have to come to us? So we created a portal where we put best practices or language access plans, things that people can look at and have, have looked at or used um, by way of uh, their, their own work and not having to come to us. Um, we know that something that agencies haven't done um, necessarily a lot of, for example, is uh, um, uh, outreach or engagement with communities in a very intentional way. So we've focused on bringing in agencies to share best practices about how they do that work um, with other agencies. Um, and we've heard really tremendous things from agencies and what they get out of those meetings, right? And most of the work is not in the meeting. It is in the aftermath of the meeting. 
Um, as I often say to my team, the work is not in the meeting. Have less meetings, do more work, right? Well, who sets the agenda for those task force meetings? We take feedback, or we, we take feedback from the agencies. Like, how does that work? Help me understand the mechanism. So um, we, one, every task force meeting, we remind <laughs> the task force that we want to hear from them, um, what they need, what would be helpful, what information could we share, what should we present on. We've had... Um, Email or phone call or... Formally and an email. Uh, sorry, orally in person and an email. Um, and we have gotten requests from task force members to have to come present on something to the task force, right? So we'll make space and room for that. Um, and we have um, centered as one of our goals, of course, because of the nature of um, our work, that we will present on policy, federal policy updates or areas that we want them to be mindful of and as sort of a flag that we're coming to you to work on these issues. So we find it very useful and constructive and positive. I think we're certainly open, as I said previously, or I think I said, to you know, what is the role that um, council could play, but I feel strongly that we're, as you said, two years in, and part of this is building the muscle of, of agencies to ask dumb questions, right? To feel like say, in a safe space with their colleagues to be able to say, oh, you do that? Or, oh, I don't have that contract, right? Do I need that contract, <laughs> right? And have the bigger, the, the robust conversation. And I really, really, really think that's important. I equally think it's important for you to be able to you know, hear from agencies. I hope that's happening, and I imagine it is, outside of a task force. But we can certainly talk about informing agenda or coming to present to a meeting or what might be the appropriate role. Well, let's talk about that too, because some of what we're thinking about in terms of the agendas are if those agendas are made public in any way or viewable by representatives of the administration or council prior to the meetings. They're not. That's something we can talk about. Are minutes of the meeting taken? There are. Yep. And are they shared? They're shared with all of the agencies. So that's internal documents, mm -hmm. not external documents. I mean, we report on what the task force did, obviously, in the annual report. Um, and so, you know, we can have further conversations about, about that. And has the task force worked on any of the MOYA recommendations listed in the 2018 calendar uh, year annual report? Oh, I think I'd have to go back and look at that to be responsive. MOYA's 2018 annual report states that MOYA hosted two meetings of the interagency, you just mentioned that, and that the discussions were focused on the purpose of the task force, the 2020 census, the barriers to LGBTQIA plus immigrant, uh, immigrants and the barriers that they face, and, in, and updates on federal and state developments. Can you tell us more about the barriers that the LGBTQIA plus immigrants face that were discussed and whether these discussions led to any changes in policies or strategies and budget uh, needs that regard any of the city agencies and the task force? Sure, I'd have to go back in terms of the, the timelines, honestly, just because I didn't look at this before <laughs> this meeting. So um, I can speak for what I have via kind of my memory and understanding of these things. So um, we presented on these issues. We brought in um, obviously our city experts that work on these issues who are not a regular part of the task force. Um, uh, to come um, and to, t to share and to talk about the, the, the work of the administration as a whole, but also how agencies need to look and approach the way that they, the needs of, of, of LGBTQIQ communities. And we have, as a part of those conversations, um, uh, we provided um, one-time funding to a coalition of groups um, led by the Anti-Violence Project to develop trainings for um, uh, legal services providers on serving, better serving LGBTQI communities. Is this like through Action NYC? Mm -hmm. and, okay. And um, so that was one outcome, and there was recent recent trainings um, that have happened in that regard. And certainly, that's not just informed by the task force, but from meeting with those groups as well. Awesome. That's a great example, and I want to follow up with with that. Sure. Um, did the task force meet in at, at the in a at least quarterly in 2019? 
We met three times. Three times. And I said, as I said, oh, that was that was just for 2019, not for 2018 and 2019. No. Got it. So three times in 2019. Thank you for clarifying that. And what were the topics of those meetings in 2019? Um, I have some of them. Um, some of the topics included public charge, which, as I said, had many, many more meetings outside of the task force, which is part of the reason we didn't reconvene for a fourth. Um, immigration enforcement, um, more broadly, um, border updates, um, DACA and TPS um, proposals. Those are some of the... Um, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, and sorry, uh, rule changes and fee waiver increases. Those are some of the federal policy updates that we talked in more great length about within the task force. Um, program updates, we shared NYC CARE, um, which, which was a really important um, uh, sharing and has actually since resulted in a lot of good cross-agency collaboration. Um, IDNYC renewals um, coming up and activating task uh, agencies to be um, a part of that effort. Um, some best practices, um, I talked about conducting outreach and engaging with immigrant communities. Additionally, the executive order um, mandating, which we're really happy about, um, that agencies utilize uh, community and ethnic media in doing their marketing efforts. Awesome, super robust, and at the end I'm gonna ask you, before you leave, to let everybody know about the renewal and that they should renew. Yes. So we'll come back for that. Okay. Okay. Well, that's gonna be your, your, your kind of closing moment. Sure. Because um, I think it's an important PSA to, to include here. Historically, Moya was established within the Department of City Planning. And given this context and connection, should the Department of City Planning be included as a task force member? Now, I have a personal connection to this question because of what's happening in Sunset Park. I don't know if you've heard or read about something called Industry City in, in Sunset Park and the impact that it's having on our immigrant communities. But from your point of view, should DCP be included? We have invited DCP to join. They're one of the additional agencies that we invite to join. Awesome. Thank you sure. for that. Yeah. And I'd like to talk to you more about, about that impact, including sure. the, the kind of displacement questions that immigrants are having and, and where Moya can play an integral role in that. Uh, you mentioned in your testimony that you have added nine additional agencies, and you just kind of spoke to DCP. Uh, what other agencies are you expanding to? Um, we've included CCHR, uh, DCWP, DCP, um, NDGBV, HPD, um, NYCM, so emergency management, NYCHA, uh, SBS, um, and TLC. Okay. Is that all of them? Are there some? What's the list? It sounds like maybe the list is shorter on the not invited list. Yeah, it's, it's shorter on the <laughs> okay. not, not invited list. All right. That's true. All right. Look, clearly we... Big business. <laughs> Big DOI. Why not? <laughs> uh, why not? We, we, we're we really concerned about transparency here. And a lot of the questions are really just trying to extract an understanding of what's happening. And our role in oversight really kind of demands information. And that's why we're here. Yeah. And accountability. Who's accountable for all this? So for us, that's that's what, what's driving both the questions around the department and and the task force and a co-chair that can drive an agenda, that can be made public. And I think our community right now really wants to see and I think depends on that kind of connection, transparency, and understanding. One, so they can feel connected to it, but also maybe potentially shape that agenda. And I'm not saying that we're not dedicated to the immigrant community, but, but our continual re return to the community isn't just in presence, it's also giving space and, and I think that's what's driving a lot of the questions. And so I really appreciate that, that yeah. uh, kind of communication, discussion, and dialogue that we're having right now. And, and we're going to continue to talk about the bills as well. So I'm done with my questions. And if you can tell, tell us all in New York City who are listening right now that we have renewals for IDNYC. Yeah. I can't believe we're finally here. Yeah. Mine expires in a few weeks. Yeah. Nobody uh, has expired yet. <laughs> <laughs> And we need to renew. Yes. So tell us a little bit about that and how important that is. 
Sure, so we're really excited um, and have shared some exciting news. We'll continue to share exciting news about renewal, but um, this is our first ever renewal. As you said, pioneering is something we do on a daily basis, um, renewal period, and um, that means that if you've had your ID NYC since 2015, you might be coming up for a renewal sometime soon. So if your card is gonna expire in 60 days or less, um, you're in that sweet spot window to start uh, looking at renewal, and you can do so in two ways. You can uh, go online, which we've tried to make as easy as possible for folks, and we're continuing to iterate based on experiences that we're hearing, um, and in person um, at any of our enrollment centers if that's what you prefer. So um, we really, and it's free. Um, and we had a whole new slate of benefit partners that we're excited about. We're excited to talk about even more to come with the program um, soon, and we encourage everybody to re renew, no need to wait. And the new card design is really beautiful. It is beautiful, absolutely. Uh, who, how many in here have your IDNYC? Raise your hand in the room. Beautiful, there's some non-IDNYC holders. This is an opportunity for you to renew, or to get your first ID. And then the second question is, how many who, who have had it have renewed already? Okay, right, all right. I mean, so, how many, nobody's card has expired. No, I know, but, but we, we're, we're in renewals right now, right? Uh, yes, but nobody's card has expired. No one's expired. And you can renew up to six months renew. after your card expires. <laughs> okay. So we're making this okay, as good point. easy as possible. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> good and important. Thank you, awesome. Well, thank you, Commissioner, okay, to you and you. your team. Thank you. And. Let's keep doing the good work. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. We have two members of the community who want to speak on the topics that we are discussing today and anything else you want to talk about, actually. Uh, we have from the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families, Hal Yi, if you can come up. Uh, Elvia uh, Mata from the Trans Latinx Network, if you can come up. And is there anyone else that ha is inspired to speak today, wants to come and say a few words, ask questions of me or of the community, come on up and we'll have you fill out a form. One last call, okay, come on up, come on up. And we'll, the Sergeant of Arms here will give you a form to, to fill out. Thank you so much for your patience in this discussion. I know the, the, the questions were, and the discussion were kind of administrative in, in, in many ways, but we're really excited for you to be here to talk about any one of these topics or anything related to the immigrant community. And if we can start here to my right, your left, and begin. Make sure that the mic is close to you and that the light as you press the button is on and you're good to go. Good afternoon, Chair uh, Menchaca and council members and staff of the Committee on Immigration. Um, my name is Elvia Mata. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am the Outreach and Benefits Coordinator at Transla NX Network. Since 2007, under the direction of Cristina Herrera, Transla NX Network has been providing services to the LGBTQ community with a focus on transgender, non-binary, and gender non-conforming individuals. We provide client-centered, evidence-based services that help our members become economically self-sufficient, civically engaged, socially connected, safe, and healthy. In addition, as we work locally and nationally to ensure the human rights of all people, regardless of gender identity or immigration status. Some of the most notable and successful programs are through our community legal clinic, Clients have been approved for asylum, received visas, gotten name and gender marker changes, successfully petitioned to remain stably housed and resolved consumer issues. In fact, many clients have been relieved that they have, they now can not disclose their gender identity through the ID NYC card, thanks to the work of the city council. Through our TGNC Bridge program, nearly a dozen of our peer leaders provide seven cultural competency trainings to 150 police officers in two precincts in Queens and two in Manhattan. ESL classes and linguistically appropriate peer support offer our clients access to English language skills and 
translation services that address their unique needs as people of TG and C and B experience. Having dignity in language can reduce miscommunication with medical immigration and other officials. Of course, we also offer vital programs necessary to keep our community safe, HIV and STD testing, access to PrEP and PEP, and condoms and safer sex kits, and seamless referrals to healthcare providers. As a daughter of immigrants, the hardships that I have seen my parents and those of my community go through upon the arrival of this country are numerous and arduous. These can be insurmountable when we speak of the experience of TGNC and NB immigrants members within TransLatinx network. Our members' needs are not foreign. Our members are simply looking for the same dignity, respect, opportunities afforded to all New Yorkers. Our members want a seat at the table. Thank you, Chairman Chaka and council members and staff of the committee. TransLatinx Network is here to partner with the council and all its members in whatever ways serve our constituents. I am happy to answer any questions you may have uh, and you may contact me as well. Thank you. Thank you, and maybe maybe just one question to start as we move through the panel is anything that you wanted to respond to in terms of the back and forth with the commissioner and the council members? Is there anything that kind of popped up in terms of, of an opportunity that you might see or something you want to highlight? Yes, um, actually, um, in terms of speaking about um, LGBTQIA, uh, issues, I think it's important, as you mentioned, um, housing, education are all also immigrant issues. Uh, but I think it's also too important to speak about decrim, decriminalization of sex work. This is also an immigrant issue, uh, particular to our community. Um, but overall, uh, it, it, it is considered an immigrant issue um, because um, any persecution uh, with sex work can lead um, to impediments in uh, obtaining a legal status in the U.S. So yes, absolutely. Thank you for that. And that's definitely not just on our uh, kind of larger grouping of agenda items that impact the immigrant community, but part of a kind of statewide discussion too on reform that's happening up there too. And that is also informing our statewide agenda. And I know we're working with you and so many other advocates on, on how to continue that discussion that just has been difficult for us to move agencies like the NYPD uh, and even some of the DAs as well. They're not all on the same page. Uh, so thank you for, for lifting that, that voice up here today. Thank you. If you'd like to introduce yourself and uh, give any testimony. Of course. So thank you, Chairman Chaka and the Committee on Immigration for convening this hearing. Um, my name is Hallie Yee, Policy Coordinator of the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families, or CACF. Um, and we are here today on behalf of the Asian Pacific American Immigrant Community of New York City. CACF is building a community too powerful to ignore. Since 1986, we have been the nation's only pan-Asian children and families advocacy organization that leads the fight for improved and equitable policies, systems, funding, and services to support marginalized American Pacific, Asian Pacific American children and families, or APA. Currently, Asian Americans are by percentage the fastest growing community in New York. Of the 1.6 million Asian New Yorkers in the state, approximately 80% live in the New York City metropolitan area, nearly doubling every decade since 1970. They make up 15% of the cities and 10% of the state's population. In fact, New York City has the largest APA population of any US city, yet the needs of the APA community are often overlooked, misunderstood, and uncounted. Constantly fighting the harmful impacts of the model minority myth, which prevent the community's needs from being acknowledged and under understood, this means that our communities, as well as the organizations that serve the community, often lack the resources to provide critical services for those in need. We work with almost 50 member organizations to identify and speak out on common challenges and needs across the APA community. APAs hail from South, Southeast, East, and Central Asian countries, as well as from the Pacific Islands. In NYC, we represent over 40 ethnicities, tens of languages and religions, and a multitude of cultures and immigration experiences. Of this group, over 70% are foreign-born, making immigration issues particularly salient for our community. 
On behalf of the almost 50 Asian-led and Asian-serving community and social service organizations that comprise our membership, we respectfully request the City Council to support the legislation introduced here today. CACF particularly supports the expansion of reporting and collection of data outlined in Ken Council Member Drum and Chairman Chalka's legislations. When government agencies collect and issue reports, this diverse population is often not mentioned or rather grouped into the generic categories of Asian, other, and sometimes even white. Within the 40 plus APA subgroups, there are unique social, educational, and economic differences associated with each ethnicity that are not being assessed and addressed properly due to insufficient data disaggregation. For decades, the APA community has been praised as the mild minority in America, overrepresented in education success stories, yet simultaneously underrepresented in stories about poverty. The way the data is presented makes it seem as though this stereotype holds true. What it obscures, however, is how unevenly success is distributed among the members of our community um, based on a number of factors, including ethnic background, socioeconomic status, and immigration experience. Evidence-based policies and targeted intervention programs are ineffective without proper needs assessment based on accurate data reports. Data disaggregation efforts are a necessary step towards developing public policy and interventions that respond to the unique needs of historically overlooked and marginalized communities. Inequity in health, education, housing, and more cannot be tackled through the existing lens of heterogeneity. We speak different languages, practice different religions, and come from different cultural backgrounds, and the consequence of generalization are severely unequal outcomes. We are by percentage the fastest growing racial group in New York, and the needs of under underserved segments of the community outstrips current levels of service. Improved collection, disaggregation, and reporting of data on APAs will improve government effici efficiency and help city agencies better support our community. Um, please stand with CACF and those we represent and support these forward-looking pieces of legislation and hear our advocacy group's concerns. I would like to thank Chairman Chaka and the entire Committee on Immigration for your leadership, and we look forward to working with you all closely moving forward on these pieces. Thank you, and I'll also give you an opportunity to any, any kind of comments you want to make? Yeah, so um, while credit is due to Moya, um, we believe that expanding the functions of Moya into a department would actually allow for the city to meet growing needs of a growing immigration population. Um, so giving them their credit, but also supporting the expansion of supports, oversights, outreach, and just so much more that could be given to our communities through a full agency. I, I don't disagree with you in the in the way that you've kind of formulated the the, uh, the kind of feedback that good work has happened, and yet even with good work, there might still be a massive gap actually yes. to the needs of so many different communities. And as immigration becomes an intersectional conversation when we think about LGBTQIA plus communities and multiple language issues and language access issues, it becomes a, a greater need. And we're, we're, we're probably still at the tip of the iceberg in terms of what kind of resources need to happen. And, and an agency might be the way through through that. Absolutely. And so thank you for that, for that comment. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Ms. Thomas, if you can uh, introduce yourself and make any and all comments you'd like to make. Yes, hi, my name is Helen Thomas. I am a citizen of New York City. And as I was sitting here, this is a new opportunity for me. And I decided that this year I was going to make sure that I did find out exactly what was going on with some of the situations and concerns that the city is bringing to fore. And I am somewhat concerned. And the reason why I'm concerned is that as a generationally born uh, American and New Yorker, uh, I really have issue with the fact that we are seemingly becoming some type of city state within the United States. We are separating ourselves from the rest of the citizens in this country based on uh, you know bifurcation and, and just uh, a lot of uh, situations that seem to be separating and as opposed to bringing us together as a nation. We are one nation, and regardless of where you came from and uh, 
what your current situation is, you are in this context. You have to remember that there are those of us who have been here for a long time, and we fought for the opportunity for those of you who have come here since um, for your opportunity to step on our backs and have the opportunity to speak out and say, we want our little share. Um, understand that I have empathy for individuals, but I think that uh, the council is somewhat disingenuous in saying that 40% of the individuals in this city are foreign born. Well, that's probably true, but the question is, being foreign born and then how many are naturalized or have visas and green cards? How many of those individuals are living here in a way that is legal, um, that is not in the same way that you're kind of saying, oh, 40% of the individuals and, and they need all these, uh, uh, ass this assistance. The question then becomes, are you being disingenuous by saying 40% of the people are foreign born? Because I know that there are individuals who are within that 40% naturalized citizens, which changes the narrative. And I would think that probably about at least half of those individuals are probably naturalized or have green cards or visas. Now that would leave like 20% individuals who are not legally here. And I say that because a law is legal and if you're not here legally, you um, have an issue. My issue with that is that when we were speaking uh, of the, of the sex trade, okay? I don't want my children to be in a situation where they are exposed to sex trade as a legal job. That's not what I want for their lives, okay? Um, I'm sorry, it, it may sound a little cold-blooded, but I don't want my children, my grandchildren, my neighbor's children to have to feel like, you know, that's a legal way to make money. Um, it's not a safe uh, occupation. It's not a good occupation. And individuals, I believe, should look to other avenues to be productive. Um, I'm, I'm just looking at the, the issues and I'm saying, as an American citizen, I've been through civil rights, I've, been, I've marched, I've done all of this stuff and, and made it possible for my father to finally vote. And now I'm going to sit back and allow individuals who don't feel that the legal system here really works. Um, I, I, I did all of that to become part of the infrastructure, not to speak separately about, you know, uh, I, I need separate you know, uh, consideration. I want to be part of the, of the structure. And, and so we have to keep in mind that there are individuals who are challenged by what you're talking about doing. Um, it's about money. It's not just about numbers, but it is about money. And we have to understand that that money comes from my pocket, my husband's pocket, um, and the, the people in this city who are working. And when you talk about state and federal, it comes from other individuals' pockets. So, you know, I, I'm just a little bit concerned that you're being disingenuous and not really talking about some of the really vital issues that not only affect the specific individuals' groups, but how do we look at the possibility of making us whole again, because we're not whole at this point. And individuals such as myself, who is what commonly is called a conservative, and I believe in conservatism because it saves human life, um, we feel a little bit left out and pushed over to the side, and at the same time, it's our um, resources that are being used and utilized to you know, help other individuals without us getting any benefit from it or us being silenced. So that, that's my real concern. I'll, you'll be seeing more of me um, 
in these hearings because I think that there needs to be another voice. And I think that there needs to be someone who's willing to step up and say, okay, I understand your issues as a human being, but there are some things that cross the line of what really needs to be done for individuals. And that Thank includes, you, you know, um, uh, the free classes for uh, English speaking. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that that's one of the unifications of a community. And if we don't have that, if I'm not able to talk to you, I can't help you, okay? The same thing with children who are here without parents. Um, how do we make sure that they're safe because they're not always safe if they're not here with someone who's going to watch over them. Because a lot of, from what I understand, that a lot of the children that have come over are not with individuals who are related to them, and they've been used as pawns to get in here and you know um, use our resources. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm concerned about those things. I'm concerned mm -hmm. about the quality of life in this city that should be at an acceptable level for everybody. So as I said, you'll probably be seeing me quite a bit more um, because I think that somebody needs to voice concerns that may not necessarily make a person feel very comfortable, but we have to think about how it affects everyone. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thomas, for, uh, for speaking your truth. And I think what, what's important here is that you feel comfortable speaking that. And the city council is is ready, willing, and able to ensure that these spaces are for everyone. And part of what is important in this discussion is that we, we speak our truth, but we also understand through data what, what is real mm -hmm. in terms of the, the information. And so I hope that we can both continue to learn from each other mm -hmm. and from this committee and the work that the staff are doing constantly to understand. So much of the conversations that we were having today with the, the commissioner was about information, mm -hmm. was about understanding that actual impact that a municipal government, which is different from the state, that has different powers, that is different from the federal government that have different powers and budgetary opportunities and responsibilities. I believe here in the city of New York, we have a, we have a, a mandate to really protect every, every soul here in the city to ensure that people can feel connected. And like you said, the wholeness of our communities is, is, is what is at stake and what is driving us. Mm -hmm. the, the fact that we do have many immigrants, and I do want to give you a sense of the approximately 56.2% of immigrant New Yorkers are naturalized. Uh, citizens. How many? Fifty-six percent. So, so that reduces the number of foreign-born. You know, because the way that that. Well, nothing's going to remove the foreign-born component. Okay. But, but I'll give you the second part, which is an estimated six hundred and sixty thousand immigrant New Yorkers who are lawful permanent residents. Exactly. Those are green card holders mm -hmm. are potentially eligible to naturalize. Mm -hmm. And so that's the other piece that we struggle with here in the city is getting that legal path to citizenship and access to those lawyers that can help them get that. Uh, like you said, there are laws. Now we can talk about my, uh, my, my kind of critique on the laws that I think that they're, they're, they're broken, but the laws today are, are giving an estimation of a large population in the city that just don't have the understanding and the access Understood. to get the lawyer to get naturalized and become a citizen. And those are the things that we're working on all the time here in the city, just to ensure that our neighborhoods get access to those, those kind of services that can lead them to a powerful voice like citizenship, that can get them a, an opportunity to vote mm -hmm. and be part of, part of the system. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there's a lot of common ground here in terms of the welfare, the general welfare of our communities. And what we're trying to do is really allow for a space like an immigration committee to highlight one community because we have so many different uh, council committees that focus on transportation, for example, mm -hmm. or homelessness, mm -hmm. or, or mental health care. Mm -hmm. and, and so that gives us an opportunity to dive deeper. And so I welcome you back to this conversation and whatever we have, every month we will have a public hearing and, and I invite you back to, to be part of this discussion and wherever your kind of political uh, thoughts are, we'll, 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 I'll take them all. Well, once again, thank you very much for that response. Um, once again, you're saying that 52% are naturalized citizens? Correct. Of that 40%. 
52% of that 40%, right? And how many are on the path uh, to? Uh, 660,000 immigrant New Yorkers are lawful permanent residents right. and are potentially eligible to naturalize. So that's about, what, another 10 or 15% of that 40%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is that it's disingenuous to say that, oh, 40% of the citizens in, in New York City are foreign born and, you know, and they're, they're, they're really desperate to be a part. They're already a part. A lot of them, even though they're foreign born, they're naturalized American right. citizens. Well, and they're and probably not having the issues that a lot of you guys are talking about. They're probably very well spoken in English. They're probably very productive in what they do and they're not hiding in the shadows as, as so many people say. So we've got to stop being disingenuous, uh, uh, pretending like, you know, kind of like not telling the, cause that's not transparency. Mm. That to, mm. to say okay. that 40% of the people are, you know, foreign born, but not to say that not that full percentage of individuals is scrambling in the shadows, okay? That's not true. The truth is that there's a very much smaller percentage of individuals mm -hmm. who are not being um, recognized within the system as being legally uh, able to participate fully. Mm. And that means that number one, it's gonna cut your budget Mm. Okay, it's going to cut back on the number of individuals that you need to help them. So let's be real about what's going on and um, what well, really is needed. I, I get you. And, and so what I want to do is I want to continue this conversation. And the, sure. the Moya report, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs annual report, which was in discussion today about some of the data, and we only have two data, two years of data, would be a great place for, for you to kind of uh, just dive deep and understand the, the kind of statistics Absolutely. that we are capturing right now. We want more statistics, which is what the conversation was today with Moya. Then and I'll, I'll, I'll give this to you so that you can, oh. you can take it okay. and, and have it. And, and again, we'll, we'll have these monthly discussions. Mm -hmm. But I, I think what one of the things that are important are that uh, all immigrant New Yorkers are facing some, some uh, or many different issues. And the question that we're having here is, how do, how do we make sure that everyone participates in the creation of government and how government responds? And my, my philosophy, which might be different from yours or anyone else in, in this room, is to take care of the most vulnerable. And that comes in different fashions. Mm -hmm. And to allow for the most vulnerable New Yorkers to be able to speak their mind, to be able to speak their truth, and to be able to understand, for us to be able to understand those needs. And that is the role of, of, our, of our city, I believe. And, and I, those are the kind of things that, that we discuss in this space. And, and I invite you to keep coming back and, and learning together about what, what those needs are mm -hmm. and and what responsibility does government have to address those needs? And government often feels like a, like a distant uh, entity, but at the end of the day, it's us. It's, it's, it's us, it's our, it's our people, it's our communities. And, and we, we have to make that not only clear, but more felt in our neighborhoods, mm -hmm. so that things like participatory budgeting, for example, you may or may not know about that in terms of communities coming together and making decisions on budget decisions, on capital improvements to parks and schools, that it's the community that is rising up and no matter your immigration status, kids as young as fourth and fifth grade can actually vote in their community and how to, how to choose where to spend a million dollars of capital improvements to city, city infrastructure, again like parks, streets, mm -hmm. schools that they can join in and, and learn about how their government works okay. so that we can, we can have better government. Better government comes from more participation from everyone, mm -hmm. no matter what, no matter what. Mm -hmm. uh, we are gonna end this, this, this discussion here today, but I welcome you back and thank you all for coming in and on the kind of advocate, uh, the kind of advocate. If you have any kind of final comments to make, um, please. Chaka, if I may. Um, uh, just make sure that you're, you're uh, your uh, okay. light is on as well. Yes. Oh, it's it on. on. Good. Um, Ms. Thomas, um, I like to acknowledge your concern, um, and in response to that concern, um, the idea of decrim decriminalization of sex work 
is not to make sex work a viable option. Um, more, it is a way to have uh, sex workers become part of the structure. Um, in order for uh, either past sex work or current sex work to not affect uh, perhaps uh, uh, a legalization process, uh, to not affect um, their needs, uh, whether they be um, legal, uh, medical, or uh, educational. Um, so decriminalization is not looking uh, to be um, the only way. Um, however, it might just be a safer way. Thank you, Ms. Mata, for that, that response and, and that dialogue. And let's continue this dialogue because I think there's a lot of education that we can have just by discussing these issues and to do it in a forum here that's transparent and connected to our communities through social media, et cetera. So thank you all for being here today, for being honest, for speaking your truth. And that's how we get and move forward together. So thank you.